Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I, ho I hope you're all staying warm. And this uh, silent disco setting is very interesting. So um, as you probably already know, like yeah, my talk is going to be about driving cultural change uh, to improve soft uh, software development and CI, CD. Um, my name is uh, Roland Heusser. I work for uh, SRI International. Um, I'm a software engineer, and uh, just to um, so my the, the the field that I work in is microservices, DevOps, and I work with the SRI Ventures team to transfer technology from our researchers to our ventures that we or to our ventures ventures and our clients. Um, if you haven't heard about SRI, SRI International before, we are a, a research uh, company in in Menlo Park. We've been there for over 70 years. Uh, our main clients are the US government and a lot of commercial clients. Um, we've been around for over 70 years. Uh, so this was basically me when I started at SRI three years ago. Uh, so like you're ready to go. You want to see all the problems. You want to design solutions for them. You want to implement code. and you may have found yourself in a similar situ situation where you want to get going. You want to, yeah, you want to, like, start collaborating and figure things things out. So, so what there are processes, and as you start looking left and right, you see more and more people, and you see mud going all around you, and you may or may not start feeling a little bit stuck in the dirt. So. What happened? So in 2017, when I started SRI, and some of these things may, are still true today, but we, we have a lot of different groups and teams. So we have five divisions, and inside each division, we have um, yeah, five to 10 like groups. And they all operate very independently. Some of them don't even use our corporate IT services. So like they have their own IT services they they use they they used like different repository systems to uh, based on their cur uh, current needs and uh, depending on if they work on government contracts or if they work on commercial contracts they had different policy and compliance requirements of my, many of these tools were in self service so you either had to reach our corporate help desk or of that particular group their help desk to help you. And uh, one of the challenges for my team that I joined uh, with was we were tasked to work with all of them because we were trying to introduce them to microservices, like how to implement them. And so we're like, well, now we have to learn how to interface with 20 different systems. And it's, it, it became a big burden for us. So we, we felt like this uh, biker or cyclist, just like, and you see this wall in front of you, and we're like, well, I just see problems, like how can, I, how can I continue? Like we need a better way to work together. So uh, we knew something had to change, but we were a very small team. So we had no, uh, we didn't have enough backing from management or we didn't have any, anything that would allow us to make the entire organization change. Um, so spoiler alert, we made it somehow. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about how we did this. So uh, from the status quo to now about 2,500 projects for, we have, in our GitLab instance, we have a little over 500 people. So we have five projects per person. Um, how did we get there? So uh, when I started in 2017, um, as I said, we needed to find a way for us to work with the other teams. Fortunately, we didn't have a lot of compliance or, or policies imposed on us. So we went ahead and just spun up uh, our little rogue instance of GitLab CE. Um, yeah, um, we, we started hosting all our projects on it and started pointing, pe uh, started and, uh, tell, told people, well, just go look at our instance. This is our code. And we started collaborating with them in this way. A lot of people got really excited about it, and they're like, well, we want to put our projects on there, too. And so we started adding them by a case-by-case -case basis, but fairly quickly, this case-by-case -case turned into a lot of projects. Um, as, we, as, we, as we grew, we realized 
based on uh, feedback that we needed more capabilities. Um, so we started adding features like more CI CD, more uh, privileged runners. You may or may not have heard about problems with uh, privileged runners. Um, for SRI, uh, since we have a lot of government work, uh, we want to make sure that if two projects run on a shared runner, that they can't modify the host. And Docker build, for example, cannot run in a non-privileged uh, system. So we needed to figure out a way how can we how can we do this without running into into compliance issues where we accidentally modify our host. One solution for this for this would be uh, an alternative build system like Canico. But back in 2017, it wasn't that well established yet. We later realized that we needed backups. So we, towards the second half of 2017, we started backing up our system. And uh, towards the end of 17, corporate IT and our Center for Software Engineering that provides a lot of services that we consume internally approached us and said, so who is running this uh, GitLab CE? Like, we don't know who in the neither corporate IT or our IT services are providing it. And our team were like, well, we kind of do. <laughs> and uh, they, they ask us all these questions. Well, so how compliant is it? Can we put ITAR projects on it? And I'm not a citizen. So pretty quickly, we realized that we needed to change this. Fortunately, they, they didn't tell us to stop. They, they, they recognized that uh, there is a huge benefit in using GitLab. So uh, they did a threat assessment. They worked on creating uh, multi-factor authentication using the Git CLI, which uh, I haven't seen another tool providing this kind of capability. And by the end of 2017, we had a GitLab EE instance spun up. In 2018, this was our kind of migration year where we migrated almost all our systems. We also discontinued all of the redundant systems that we had. So that was um, a big year of like getting rid of licenses that we don't no longer have to pay. And in 2019, we, made, uh, we basically just worked on increasing the usage of our current GitLab instance and uh, even upgrading it. Um, so th this is how in just a few minutes, how we made this entire migration process. So what helped us transitioning from, to the, from the status quo to where we are now? I identified six factors that I think we did right that helped us for this migration. And the, the first one would be leading by example. So we, we started. Uh, finding a system that fits the needs that we had, and we, we started using it, showing um, other people how we can be successful. Then the second factor is templates. So like we, we don't just like lead and show off crazy tricks. We also show them how we did it, and so that others can learn from, from um, yeah, how we, how we achieved the um, so that others can learn from, uh, from us how they, they, uh, they can achieve what we did. Another important piece is education. So uh, together with the Center of Software Engineering, we started setting up uh, like a help desk email specifically for GitLab. We started adding channels to Mattermost so that they can collaborate or ask questions. We provided hackathons and demos where we use GitLab so more people got exposed to it and saw how it can be used. Our fourth factor is evangelism. So we, we, at the beginning, when we started using GitLab, we didn't, didn't expect it would cause such a drastic change. But like just the people seeing us using it and getting excited about it kind of snowballed and uh, helped uh, getting GitLab, like uh, get corporate IT and everyone else excited ab about it. So I think evangelism is a very powerful tool that we had. And then, oops, I went one step too far. Uh, feedback, 
I think uh, the, our Center for Software Engineering and uh, all the people that were involved setting up the, uh, the GitLab instance did a great job at listening to the feedback that people brought to the table. So when people had uh, issues with GitLab runners, if they needed help integrating in existing infrastructures, it's like, how can we use it with Kubernetes? How can we um, use it with our artifact delivery system? Like our uh, uh, people, they are very, very, very responsive and they set up documentation and they help everyone to like be successful and then the, the last piece is compliance so while our first instance of GitLab was not compliant our current uh, instance makes it very easy to be in compliance with all the restrictions and requirements that we have um, they, they we put a lot of energy in automating our compliance process where before you had to send emails to people and they they had to add you to a project or even set up the project and they had to ask your manager or other people to get approval. So it was a very slow process that could take days. Now with, the, with our current compliance process, how it works is we can set up the project, add a configuration file, and that will, in, will be picked up by an automated system that then actually verifies who can have access or not. I'm gonna talk about this on this next slide a little bit more because as I just started mentioning, compliance can get a little dirty and sometimes it kind of hits you in the face with a lot of dirt. But we, we have, as, as a government contractor, we have to follow like CUI and ITAR restrictions. And as a commercial contractor, we also have to follow their contract requirements. So, um, what should I say? Um, so, we, in one of the things we did is we decided that hosting on-premise was the right choice for us so that we have more control. Um, then the, the Git, what I mentioned earlier is for Git, we added a plugin that we can do multi-factor authentication for especially for external collaborators on our system. Then the groups, for example, top-level groups on GitLab are managed by our IT services, but self-service is very important. So all subgroups are, are managed, are self-service, and projects are self-service by default. So whenever I need a project, I can just create it, and as I mentioned, I can add a, a meta file that says which contracts this project is associated with, and then our, our bot will, de de will read this file and decide if that project is one that is access restricted, or if it, is access unre unrestricted. And if, if it is restricted, the, how we manage uh, um, or how we ensure our compliances is that uh, nobody can, like, inside GitLab can add or remove users at that point, then we just use an LDAP uh, process where we just use them through our, uh, where we add and remove users through LDAP and an admin will do those changes. Um, yes. So what is the result? The result of this uh, process is that we have a self-service infrastructure. I, I think this is a very important piece that, um, that we initially didn't have and that we were able to achieve with GitLab so that people can self-provision things. Like we, they, if they have to ask permission for everything, it takes a lot of energy and time. Um, we greatly facilitated our compliance process. We made it uh, after the fact, so I can create the project and then I go through the compliance project uh, process. And uh, it's also more transparent. I know how they are, uh, how these, uh, how our compliance process works, uh, because uh, I know how the company decides uh, who, on, on what information these decisions are being made. We reduced a lot of cost because we, there is less waiting there is a, a, lo a lot less communication for us to, to um, get repositories set up and configured. Uh, the maintainability is, has greatly improved. Uh, our, our, our Center for Software Engineering always tells me that they, the, free, the frequent up updates on every 20 seconds are a blessing and a curse. It's, uh, they always get the latest and greatest features that everyone wants to use, uh, and they regularly update the system. And we improved collaboration. Um, so our, the takeaway 
that you, I, hope, I hope you take from this talk is that uh, start small with, uh, with a small instance. Make sure that it works for your environments. Try out all the different settings that you have. Um, try to lead by example. So yeah, if you try out everything that you use at your company, uh, you can see what breaks and what doesn't. And uh, make sure you automate your compliance processes or make them, um, uh, uh, make sure that they have as little friction as possible. And uh, we, we invested in energy, a lot of energy in setting up documentation, especially where we deviate from like standard documentation that GitLab, for example, has. So like we outlined, this is what we do differently, what you should pay attention to. But if you just want to know how a merge request works, Go look, go look at the GitLab standard documentation, or if you want to know how pipelines or the, or the YAML configuration works, go to GitLab. And um, yeah, I actually went way faster through this presentation than I planned to, but um, I think this would leave uh, some time for questions. And um, so you're going around with the microphone and Yeah, we do have time for questions. So. Anyone uh, have any what? Here, here we go. I'm particularly interested in, in more details on the automation you've done, particularly around the ITAR compliance. If you want to have an ITAR or some other sensitive, you know, distro A or excuse me, distro D project, you know, what kind of things do you do in your compliance process to help that out? Um, that's a good question. Um, um, so, I'm trying to think how I can best answer your question. So, what, what we what we do is we have. Um, I'm I'm, I'm going to circle around your question for a second. So, what, what we do have so when when we create a new project, we add this meta file that says which contracts is, it is associated to, and that um, will be picked up by our, our automated system, which then will. Um, notify like one of our admins that like, this is a project that has been labeled as like um, ITAR restricted. And then um, we have um, a group that will, will like b b go through like the export control if we want uh, like non-citizens to work on that uh, particular uh, project or uh, and um, yeah, like verify who can have access. Um, then the what, 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 then, what then will happen is that they will reach back to the person who created that project and ask like who, like who else they want to add to it. And then um, they'll, uh, those people will then respond and, um, and uh, they will like check the, the restrictions on that project and uh, add them to the LDAP group. Now, I think your question is more around like how they then ensure the ITAR compliance. Yes. Um, well, our, our meta file inclu includes a list of all the people that should have, or like we, we add all the people that we want to have access to. So it's basically a YAML file that we, we customize that the, the bot will pick up. And um, yeah, I think that um, basically solves that problem. Um, does that somehow answer your question? Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, just one moment. Hi, congratulations again on the radical transformation. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> um, any challenges have you seen with import? Uh, did you import from native Git, or was it from another uh, provider? Um, we, uh, we had like a mix of, of multiple, like we had a lot of different um, on-premise on -premise version from all the GitLab competitors that you know. And uh, we had also SVN repositories, and we had Mercurial repositories that we had to migrate. So we, yeah, we went through all of those. Any specific challenges you would like to give us uh, feedback? I think the biggest challenge we had is that a lot of teams uh, love their autonomy. So they're like, why should I migrate to a, corpor a corporate IT provided service if we can just do it ourselves? And why now do we have to add this meta information to each re repository, which is just one file? But um, there is still a challenge around, um, they, they feel like they lost control over their 
their baby. And I can, I can understand that, uh, but at the same time, GitLab brings so much more benefits that that is a net, 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 naturally, it's, it's such a sm small drawback. It's, um, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Hey there, uh, so I'm curious, how did you guys uh, go through that migration process of migrating from SVN to GitLab? How did you guys handle that period where you may be uh, working in both environments and mm -hmm. dealing with dependencies that may exist in both the ecosystems? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a in, I think in most of the SVN repositories, we were fortunate enough that we could like just, I mean, use the migration script that retains the, the changelog and just like migrate those repositories. Uh, we still have some huge SVN repositories remaining that we, we can't migrate at once because uh, they're gigantic. So we have to chunk, uh, chop them into pieces, but um, in, in general, we were able to like just migrate them in one step. <laughs>